All right. Thank you. So as I was introduced, my name is Alex. I'm a senior software developer engineer at Microsoft. And I'll present to you what WinUI 3 is, how it came to be, and what the Windows Community Toolkit is doing to support this new initiative. So what is WinUI 3? But to answer that, I actually have to go back in time. Let's go back to 1992 when Microsoft launched MFC or the Microsoft Foundation Class Library. Back then, we all we had was Windows 3.1. And that was the state-of-the-art library to develop UI with native C++ development for Windows. That was the state-of-the-art framework that we shipped in 1992. Some of you might even remember that. Uh, not far from there, uh, 10 years later, we shipped Windows Forms and .NET in 2002. And by then, it was the state-of-the-art development, but it only supported .NET development. So if you used C++, you couldn't just migrate all your C++ code to leverage WinForms. Not far, four years later, we also shipped WPF, where we, when we introduced XAML to the world, uh, all, all, along with Windows 8, which then evolved to the universal Windows platform later. But it was the state-of-the-art UI framework. And, well, it only covered .NET, so, and some of the, um, some of the structures that you had for WinForms were not as easily translatable to, um, to WPF. So you couldn't just migrate all your WinForms code to WPF. And you actually had, by then, we, we had three different state-of-the-art frameworks that were all supported by Microsoft. And six years later, we shipped the util pzaml, which was the evolution of the universal Windows platform, uh, of Windows 8 that evolved to the universal Windows platform. But by then, oh, absolutely perfect. Now we are embodying the latest graphical engine. Uh, we're embody embodying the fluent design system. We support touch and new device form factors much better. And we also supported C++ and .NET. Oh, perfect. So that means that um, we now have only one state-of-the-art framework, right? Well, not really. It was just another state-of-the-art framework because uh, when we revealed the UDLP framework to the world, we split it, um, the, the development for Windows, in two different uh, frameworks. We actually had the UDLP apps and we had Win32 apps. So there are two completely different uh, application execution models that Windows handles in a completely different way. So even though we supported C++ and .NET, if you developed an application using Udo P XAML in 2012, you were inside the sandbox that didn't allow you to run all the code that you have either from MFC or WinForms or WPFs. So it was a trade-off and it did work for quite a large portion of applications, but we didn't solve the state of the unique state of the art problem that we have. So there you go. Now we have four state of the art UI frameworks, and one of them is about to turn 30 years old. And yes, we do support them all. So, what is WinUI 2? Before we, sh we say what WinUI 3 is, we have to show what WinUI 2 is. So, WinUI 2 is uh, it stands for the Windows UI library, and it's a product in market. It's not something that is coming in the future. Uh, it's mature, and we've been shipping it since October 2018, and it consists, consists of UI controls and styles that run on top of the universal Windows platform. So all the buttons that you have that come from the windows.ui.xaml.controls namespace, um, we have different controls and styles built on top of those controls uh, that we ship um, unbundled from the platform. So if we have a very brand new control, um, we don't have to wait 
for your customers to update Windows to actually have access to that. Because you have to understand that the Windows SDK is just an interface that you access, but the implementations are actually in the OS. That's how we was back in 2012 with UDLP. But with WinUI 2, some of these were actually bundled just as a NuGet package. Yes, you could leverage those through a thing called XAML Islands in Win32s, but they're not so easy to use uh, and you're still leveraging the APIs that exist only on the OS. And some of them, just some controls and styles lived in the WinUI 2 library. But WinUI 3 is the evolution of that. So it's much more than just some styles and controls. It's the entire code base of UDLP XAML, plus all the WinUI 2 controls and styles, plus the, the Windows 10 visual layer, all into a single UI framework that ships independently of the OS, just like WinUI 2 does today, but with much more. And the most important part, it works everywhere. You're not leveraging it on Win32 applications through some black ma magic like what XAML Islands is. It's, it literally just works on Win32 and UDLP applications. And that is just the first component of this new initiative called Project Reunion that we announced at Build, which I will briefly mention later today. So again, WinUI 3 contains the latest and greatest fluent controls and styles, the best user experience on Windows, native UI performance in any application, let that be C++ or .NET. So if you want to, you can be inside a container. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Your app can be a full uh, Win32 app and it supports .NET 5 and the latest versions of .NET. When we shipped UDLP back in 2012, we actually shipped a thing called .NET Native, which was a version of .NET Core, version of .NET, um, that right now is stuck on .NET Standard 2.0. And we're not going to add more support for newer versions of .NET on top of .NET Native. So if you wanted to use new features of C Sharp, for example, anything after C Sharp 7.3, if I'm not mistaken. So if you wanted to use nullable types um, from C Sharp 8, you, you, you can't leverage that from a .NET native or any UDLP applications. But with WinUI 3, you can if you're targeting desktop. Uh, and again, you decide when to upgrade. We're not forcing you that down that path. So we'll ship WinUI 2 with new controls and WinUI 3 with everything unbundled uh, for, for a considerable time um, together at the same time. Uh, when we ship, it's just going to be one more option for you. Uh, we're not replacing anything. It simply offers another option that supports the latest fluent controls. For UDLP application, it's pretty much the next version of UDLP XAML, but uh, developers will be able to use it in a more streamlined way. For Win32 devs, on the other hand, Imagine it as a new option to develop modern applications, but more familiar to you. As one example is the WinUI 3 desktop application is just creating a, um, a window, which is pretty much just an HWIN, uh, which then it's drawing on top of. So if you want to call any Win32 API, like set windows pass, any Win32 dev uh, out there, definitely call that API at least once in your life. Uh, you can just do that with the WinUI 3 window, and it's just going to do whatever it's supposed to. Uh, we will also, in the future, provide an analyzer and DS code fix to help you migrate your existing code uh, to WinUI since the namespace has changed. But I will mention that uh, later today. So a quick roadmap of WinUI 3, um, and that's important. It's definitely subject to change. Um, in the first preview that we had, was Alpha 1 that we shipped last November at Ignite, last Ignite. Uh, the second Alpha shipped in February, uh, not long after adding the WebView support. Uh, preview 1, which we shipped at Build, was the first version to support Win32 applications. Uh, that was back in May. And last month in July, we shipped Preview 2, which was much more of a stability update on top of Preview 1. We should ship Preview 3 by September at Ignite with new features and new capabilities. Uh, by November, not long after that, uh, we should actually go open source. 
So when you write two, today is open source. It's all developed out in the open on GitHub, but WinUI 3 is not yet. By November, we'll ship um, uh, the full source on GitHub. Um, and we also ship a new version that will be the first uh, go live version. Even though it's a preview version, uh, we do support it on go live and uh, uh, we recommend you to use it in production apps, of course, uh, if you want to, if it fits all your needs. So just as a side note, um, the .NET ecosystem that the .NET framework um, allows you to develop for is composed of pretty much anything that you can think of, desktop, web, mobile, gaming, IoT, the cloud, which is a big, uh, uh, big workload that we have right now for .NET applications. Um, but WinUI is not as broad as the whole .NET environment, right? We do support desktop, some dual screen devices in the future, and gaming on Xbox. Uh, but we partnered with Uno, with which, by the way, next week you're going to have their conference, the UnoConf, which is going to be free uh, for the first time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we partnered with Uno uh, when we shipped Preview 1 by Build, and they added support to WinUI Preview 1, so your code could run on some other uh, workloads, such as web, mobile, uh, dual screen devices on Android for the Surface Duo that we're shipping, uh, and also IoT. So if you want to learn more, just search for Uno Framework. They're absolutely amazing partners, and they will continue to support WinUI in the future. So what actually is the Windows Community Toolkit? I'm, I'm not going to many details, um, but if you want to search more, just go to ak.ms slash WCT, Windows Community Toolkit. It's a suite of extensions and helpers for Windows development. So a bunch of library, it's, it's a, a NuGet packages, right, that you can download into your application that has controls, extension helpers that are not part of the framework, but we think it should be. So for .NET developers, uh, you can't use it if you have a... Uh, C++ application, that's a very important thing to, to notice. Um, but we do support UDLP and .NET standard. Some of our packages are actually .NET standard. I think the oldest version we support is 1.4, but we do have uh, .NET standard 2.1 packages that support nullables as well, and 2.0 to support UDLP. Uh, we are part of the .NET Foundation. We're not completely owned by Microsoft, and we are licensed under the MIT license. Just some numbers, some rough numbers on the lifetime stats for the, the toolkit. We had over 25 releases in the last three years, about more than 1,337 issues closed, uh, and this number just keeps growing. <laughs> uh, more than 5 million downloads on NuGet, more than 10,000 commits, and more than 200 contributors. So even though it's an in initiative that was born uh, from a Microsoft employees, um, it, we, we do have con more than 200 contributors. We do rely on the community to um, evolve the framework, uh, not only with uh, opinions, but also with PRs and a bunch of different uh, features that we ship um, throughout our releases. So just a comparison, a quick comparison, I'm not going through all of these. Uh, WinUI is directed by the platform. The Windows Community Toolkit is directed by partners and the community. WinUI supports C++ and WinRT, and WinRT, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more details of that um, later. Um, but it, it's built with C++, but it supports C++ and C Sharp and any .NET language that projects to WinRT, that can read WinRT projections. Um, WinUI components need a broad at, um, audience and appeal, so it's not as easy to add something into WinUI. Um, the toolkit, on the other hand, we have much more smaller components uh, and helpers, which are just easier to prototype and gather feedback. Uh, where on WinUI, you actually need a complete spec before you implement anything. It's a, a much more complex um, process, which actually makes sense because they do support that for a longer time than we do. The toolkit, um, we, we do a, a lot of breaking changes around our major releases where the WinUI framework, they, they don't. They, they just don't do breaking changes, or if they do, they are very, very minor. Uh, and it's also owned by Microsoft engineers, whereas the toolkit is owned by the .NET Foundation. 
So get started today, contribute tomorrow, go to aka.ms slash Windows Toolkit app. That is a Microsoft Store app with our sample app, which is actually an interactive application where you can see the XAML on one side and see the changes that you do the XAML on the, on the executing app. So you can live edit the XAML and test every single control and helper that we have. So that's our playground that we use for pretty much anything. Uh, we shipped version 6.1 not long ago, uh, I think about a month and a half ago. 7.0 already have some very cool, interesting features, such as the MVVM library that Mike and Sergio are going to show you next week here on .NET North. And the version 8, that is a pre-release version, that is the one that I'll be showing to you today, uh, takes a dependency on WinUI 3. And we're shipping that in, uh, very likely in the beginning of next year. It minimizes our testing requirements across the platform versions since we have a unique uh, stable base and improve the existing uses of platform controls such as the color picker. I'll, I'll go into more details when I actually show you the demo. So actually, let's, let's do it. Um, as you can see, I do have a global.json file here just with um, a different uh, specific .NET framework version. So WinUI 3 Preview 2, which is the latest available version, supports only .NET Core Preview 5. And the latest version of .NET 5 Preview is Preview 7. So you just have to be careful not to try to use it now. It's sorry, it's our mistake. Um, um, we should fix that by Preview 3. Uh, but I just added this file so I know that I'm using the SDK and the runtime for Preview 5 and not Preview 7. You can easily use .NET new uh, global JSON, uh, global config to configure that with a specific version. So let me open VS here real quick and I'll create a new project. So one of the things that I did was install the, the, the VISIX for WinUI 3 that you can download through aka.ms slash WinUI3. Uh, I'll have the link later in, in on the slides. And uh, once you install that, you have templates not only for c -sharp, but also for C++ uh, in this category, WinUI. We have here WinUI in Eagle P, but that's not the one I want. I want a blank app packaged WinUI desktop. It's, a, it's an important point in time that we have that we only have a packaged application. So once I actually build this template, it's going to create me not one project, but actually two projects inside the same solution. That's because they're, that they're, it creates the CS project that actually builds my WinUI application, but it also builds a WAP project, which is an MS, which builds an MSIX for me and packages my application to be shipped on the store. As of right now on Preview 2, that's a requirement. That's not going to be the case whenever we GA, uh, we go for general availability. Uh, you will be able to just have an exe file, double click on it, and it will open your fully winter applications not being packaged. Uh, that's the template that I'll choose right now. Let me just put this in my desktop, and I'll just put it inside this folder dot net north when you wipe three demo just for the check so I don't type anything wrong. Okay, it's looking good. Once I click on the create button, it's going to ask me, that's for the WAP project. It's going to ask me the minimum version that I want to support and the target version. So WinUI 3, one of the biggest advantages of leveraging WinUI in general, not only WinUI 3, um, WinUI 2 as well, is that we can go a little bit down level with what we're supporting. So let's say that we um, built we as Microsoft, we built a new control and we want to ship it in a new version of Windows. So if you as a developer want to leverage that new control, you have to wait for all your customers to actually upgrade your OS, upgrade their OS to the new version so that your app can actually run and that component is actually present. You're not shipping that new control inside your app that goes to the store. Um, you're just using the interface and actually using the implementation that is built on the OS. WinUI 2 and WinUI 3 actually extracts that 
just to a NuGet package so you can actually use it uh, undocked from the platform and going down to older versions of Windows. So that's one of the big benefits uh, of using WinUI uh, 2 and 3 as well. WinUI 3, we go down all the way down to 17.134, which is our March uh, 2018 update. So I can actually set my minimum target version to this version. And I know that all my UI layer is not going to have any problems with running all the way down to that version. So that's what I'm going to select. It's actually going to create the project and the solution here in this folder. Okay, it just opened on my other window right here. All right. So that, um, as you can see, we actually do have the two uh, projects that I mentioned. And if I open, uh, double click on this project right here, you see that we're actually leveraging the new CS Proj SDK style. Uh, so it's not a long, very long CS Proj that we had back on ULP. Um, it's the most streamlined version, the same that you would find on any .NET Core application. So we have a package reference to WinUI. This is the VC runtime forwarders that are a requirement whenever you're using C++ components, WinUI is built with C++, so you actually require that. Um, we have our target framework versions, as you can see, the minimum version, uh, but we also have the target framework. And as you can see, we're actually targeting NAT5, which is the new moniker for .NET 5 applications. So this is running under the .NET 5 uh, runtime, so we have access to every single API from .NET 5 available. We also have the packaging project, which actually wraps that into the MSIX. So that's the one that I actually want to ship. But everything else that we see here is very familiar. We do have an app.manifest, which is different from the package.appax manifest. This app.manifest is a Win32 concept, uh, but that's built in. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, the, the tooling will take care of that for us. If you want to add anything else, you can. The app.saml file that we have is very similar to any we need, um, to any ULP applications that you might have built in the past. We also have this XAML controls resources, which is added by default in the app.saml, which actually um, applies the styles and allows you to use all the resources from WinUI 2. That's actually something that we had back on WinUI 2 because we were actually building on top of ULP. This will actually go away in the future on WinUI 3. You won't require this. This is just a point in time. Um, the app.xaml.cs is a little bit different. Uh, you might notice that um, every single namespace that we have it, uh, for UDLP applications, it used to be windows.something, and now they are all microsoft.something. That's a very important step, and it's the very first step that you need to do when you want, if you want to migrate your applications from UDLP to .NET, um, to WinUI 3, which is changing the namespaces. We call that looks to MOOCs. So it's windows.ui.saml, to microsoft.ui.saml. And as you can see, all the namespaces here, they all changed from micro, from Windows UI XAML to Microsoft UI XAML, dot controls, dot data, dot input, et cetera. But the application class we, we, uh, itself uh, didn't change much. We, um, instead of being a Windows UI XAML application, it's a Microsoft UI XAML application, but the concepts are just uh, very similar. We do have an on-launched event, and non-suspending, um, the one thing that is new is the window itself. So this class, this uh, window class is a new concept, which is quite similar to the one we had back on WPF. Uh, so as you can see, now we have this main window.saml, not uh, main page.saml. We still have the concepts of pages, but this is actually the Win32 window that is creating that HWIN for us and drawing on all the content inside it. So if we actually go to the main window.xaml, that's where um, the template is creating the very simple uh, stack panel with a button inside it that has a, an even handle for, for the click. Uh, but if you wanted to create something a little bit more complex, let's say that you actually wanted the same that we had on UDLP, you wanted a frame and you wanted to navigate from one page to another, 
you would just delete this code and actually add your frame here and inside the main window.xaml.cs after the initialized component, you would actually uh, navigate inside that frame. That's what you would do. I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'm just gonna run it the way it is. I just prefer running x64 just because. And once I press F5, it's going to build my WinUI 3 application. It's going to package it inside an MSIX and it's going to install it on Windows. Um, that takes a few seconds, but what we'll see is simply a stack panel and a button. And once we click on the button, which will have the text click me, it will change the content to collect. So it already built a both project. It just started the deployment and it might go to my other screen. So I might have to move it. Just starting the debug, loading all the symbols. And yeah, okay, perfect. It went to the right window. And as you can see, we have this brand new WinUI 3 desktop application running the full context of .NET 5 and the full context of Win32 with no kind of um, sandbox at all. You can see that this is Win32 just by clicking here. It's not the, the same uh, header that we had on ULP applications that had a different color by default. Uh, but as you can see, it's very responsive. Of course, I don't have a very complex demo at all in here, but once I click on this button that is now saying click me, it actually switched to clicked. And that's pretty much it. It's an application. What you build on top of it is what actually makes it magical. So um, what I'll be showing now is the Windows Community Toolkit sample app. So that's the playground that I mentioned that this is the version that comes from the store. Uh, the latest version that we have is a 6.1 release. And if you click here on the controls for, as one example, we have a range of controls. One of them is the range selector, um, which just uh, enables you this beautiful range selection. Uh, you can actually see the XAML once you click here. It uses the Monaco editor, loads a web view here to actually do all this live editing, which is quite nice. Um, you can see that we, all we have to do to use a control from the token is add the XML namespace, if it's a XAML page, of course, and add the control and just use it. This is just doing some bindings, but it's very simple. Uh, but I want to show you something else that looks a little bit better. So actually, let me get the grid splitter, uh, which is another quite nice control that we have on the token, which allows you to have this grid-like style um, to lay out your content, but you can enable the user to actually move and resize it, which is not something that comes from the platform. It might be a too specific scenario that WinUI just might never implement, but the toolkit is offering you that. So uh, what I'll be doing is copying some of the code from here. So I'll just copy the resources from this page and one important thing to notice is that the main window itself, the window class, and that's the kind of feedback, that's why we're having these previews. Um, the window itself doesn't have uh, resources, which might feel kind of odd, uh, and based on your feedback, we might change that. So um, I'll actually have to add all those resources inside the grid. Just so I don't forget, let me just delete this, uh, this type right here, this method right here, the callback. Uh, and inside the grid, I'll put grid, yeah, the intelligence is still not working as it should. Uh, again, this is a preview. So dot resources. And if I put all those styles here, now I can leverage them inside this grid. And I'll also copy the whole grid that contains this whole UI just to see how it will behave inside my WinUI 3 application. So once I paste this here, uh, it should work, right? But of course, we're missing the using of the namespace. And of course, uh, the toolkit doesn't come for free. You have to actually add the NuGet package manually. So let me quickly go up, uh, select the XML, and as the namespace that was added to the head uh, of in here, the page, I'll just add it to go to the full window. And once I have that, and just fix the formatting here a little bit. Uh, now we can actually add that to our new get packages for this project to actually be able to leverage um, the, the grid splitter control from the toolkit. One important thing to, to, to mention 
is that um, the preview version eight of the toolkit we're not shipping to new yet because it's a very early preview. So we're shipping it only inside our Windows Community Toolkit MyGet, which you can get from the Windows Community Toolkit uh, GitHub page. But once you add this different package source, which you can easily add on VSS settings, if you go to browse and include the pre-release, uh, you see the Microsoft.toolkit.utilp.ui.controls, and of course, every single package that we ship on the toolkit. Uh, that's the one I want, is the controls one. I know that the grid splitter exists over there. So I'll just add it here, and of course, I'll accept all the licenses. Why wouldn't I, right? That is installing the NuGet package inside my project. And okay, that worked. Now ignore all these errors. Those are just tooling issues. Uh, if I press F5 now, I don't think I forgot anything. This will build my sample. It will pack the toolkit, the version eight of the toolkit that is based on WinUI. So if you try to use version six, Point 0.1 or version 7, it would literally just not work because the whole root of things are not based on the same UI elements, which are the base classes for everything or the dependency objects that you have. So when UI actually requires you to leverage the Microsoft.UI.xaml.dependency um, object and UI elements and everything for your Visual 3. So as you can see, once I use the version eight, which actually we did a whole refactory, which I'll mention uh, in a minute, we actually could leverage that exact same control inside our WinUI 3 app. Uh, it's really cool. Um, of course, what we, we expect from this is to gather feedback on things that are not working or, or things that you uh, expect to work from this WinUI 3 desktop. So, but the, the interesting thing is that all the, the controls that we've built over the last three years on the toolkit, now you can also leverage them on your Win32 applications through WinUI 3, which is by itself a very cool thing. And as you can see, it's very responsive. It literally just works maybe even better than it worked on, on ULP applications. Um, but of course, this is too simple, right? Um, here is the ULP version of the Windows Community Toolkit sample app. Um, well, what if I actually built the whole sample app on top of WinUI 3? And that's another thing that we did. We migrated the whole application. And as you can see, it's quite similar. We have these beautiful backgrounds uh, that Michael created. Um, so this one is the Windows, the, the, the Util P version. You can see that there's this beautiful background <laughs> that Michael picked up from Unsplash. Uh, he always takes these amazing images. And the version for WinUI, the WinUI version of this application is a different one, which I also love. It's just amazing. Uh, but if I put them side by side, you can barely see the difference, right? Um, one thing that you notice is that the title bar changes its background color once the window uh, is on focus. Uh, there's also the back button, which is slightly different because this one is the actual style that exists. And this back button is just a blank button because the style uh, was removed on WinUI 3. Uh, that was not supposed to be the case. That's a bug, but, uh, but that's going to be fixed in the future. But um, if we try to run something else, I don't know, maybe just the adaptive grid view from the toolkit and the exact same animations, as you can see, all the same beautiful animations that we have from connected animations framework that we have from the platform and the connected animations helper that we have on the toolkit, they just work. I didn't have to re-implement any. Uh, and if I open the adaptive grid view now on the WinUI 3 version, as you can see, it literally just works. And we have equivalents of these APIs. I will mention this change. This is changing from a content dialog to a message dialog uh, because the, uh, the content dialog uh, the message dialog from ULP don't work well uh, with uh, WinUI 3. There is a reason for that. Um, but you can definitely build very compelling applications just as exactly the same application. We literally have two different heads, but we're sharing all the source uh, between our ULP application and our WinUI 3 application. So let me go back to the slides. 
And now I'll mention, I'll briefly mention the saga that was to migrate the Windows Community Toolkit to OANY 3. Uh, the toolkit is a very large, large library, and we literally started on day one uh, at Microsoft Ignite, November 4, 2019. Uh, we did all the initial work at Ignite while attending. So it was launched on the Monday. And by the by Thursday, uh, beginning of, uh, I think it was by Thursday, we actually had something building and that ran. Uh, so I could actually build the, uh, the, the, the NuGet packages again, create a new WinUI 3 app. Back then, it was not on top of... Uh, when you are desktop, so we were still building just this completely um, undocked version of the platform controls, the platform UI, so when you are three, but on top of Util P still. Um, now we have this version that works on top of when you are three preview one and now preview two that does support uh, desktop applications uh, for Win32 apps. So by the end of the week, we got most of it working, but it was pretty much that 80-20 rule that was much more of a 99 by one rule. So 80% of the work we did in the first 20% of the time. The last 20% of the work is, take, is definitely taking us the other 80% of the time. Um, and uh, I started to do that work when I was at Ignite. And I thought, well, either I do the work and somebody else is going to review it or somebody else will do it and all have to review it. And I, I had a feeling that it was going to be a lot of work. So I, I, I rather just do the work and somebody else review it, not me. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry <laughs> because this change, uh, that's the PR that we currently have. It's on draft. We're not going to merge it until it's in a much more stable. But as you can see, we have 863 files changed, changes. So I really think that I did the right thing. Sorry, Michael, um, that's not going to be an easy PR to review. I know it's going to be the fact. But to be completely honest, yes, 863 file changes may look like a lot, but most of the files are only this. We're literally just changing from the Windows UI XAML namespace to Microsoft UI.xaml. This is just one example that's in a different NuGet factory we have, which is the developer tools, and that's the focus track. It's just one other helper class that we have. Um, but we didn't have to change one line of code. It's just the usings. So to be honest, that's not something you actually have to review too long, right? Um, so that's not going to take a long time. Um, so migrating from ULP to WinUI 3, the very first thing I did was replacing Wux to Mux. So it's a replace all. It's not exactly all. Some things still uh, exist in the Windows that Y.xaml. Uh, and there are actually reasons to, to be there. Uh, just as one example, the color class. The color class is still on the windows.ui.xaml.color. But the colors, in plural, the colors class, which is pretty much just a static, like colors.red, colors.blue, it's a static um, accessor class that provides you static accesses to some specific colors, not the, the color structure itself, that one exists in Microsoft.UI.sample. So some things migrated, some things didn't, and it actually does make sense for something still to still be inside the Windows UI XAML namespace. Uh, but you have to understand that if you're just migrating to WinUI 3, you might be migrating from more than one thing to another. Um, you are not only migrating from the built-in controls to WinUI 3, so it's not only just the namespace changes, you're also changing the whole way, the execution model of your process, and you're changing it from a UDLP application to a Win32 application. You might also be changing from older APIs to newer APIs. Uh, like I mentioned, the, uh, the message dialogue migrating to the, uh, sorry, the message dialogue to the Windows, the content dialogue. Yeah, I was confused with those two APIs. Uh, another important thing that you very likely will need to migrate if you haven't done so is the XAML root API. So back when we shipped UDLP, we had this concept that your application would always be like a full screen application and you wouldn't have multiple windows. So it was quite easy to know where things were attached. 
that was not the case. That would back then it was looking back then it was probably a bad decision. Um, but now we fixed it. So we do have this concept of a XAML root, which is required for the framework to know where things are actually attacked. One example is exactly, um, I mentioned the message dialogue API, which simply back then you could just create a dialogue, new message dialogue and pass the content of it and just call dialogue.show async. It just knew where to, to render it. Uh, that doesn't work on WinUI 3 when you're running on desktop. Um, so now what you actually have to do is create a content dialogue and migrate to this different API where you actually have to set the title of the top dialogue and the close button text, and you actually set the XAML root. In this case, it was inside the code renderer, which was already an element that was part of the visual three. So... Um, we already had access to a XAML root. So this XAML root equals XAML root is actually XAML root equals this dot XAML root. So it's the one from the code render. Uh, so WinUI 3 desktop doesn't have the concept of a, a single window dot current. So which one is the root, right? That's the concept that XAML root brings to you. So if you wanted to support XAML islands, that's something that you might have already did to your library, just as one example. Uh, most of the calls to anything that get for current view might have a different behavior. Uh, most, mostly the application view, the core application and the core window, uh, all of these dot get for current view might either return null or return a sub object that doesn't actually have all the same information. So one example is like display information dot get for current view dot. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are date DPI. API is available there, so you know which API your your window is actually running on. Well, we have an equivalent for that coming from the XAML root. So the XAML root have a dot .dpi something that actually provides you that. So you just have to be careful and migrate to these new APIs, but some of them are, they just work. Like the connected animation service uh, dot .get for current view, that's going to return a different object, but it's the same interface, so it's just going to work. Um, one other very important thing is the dispatcher. So since we also had this concept of always running in only one window in ULP, of course you could create a different window, but then you would span a different thread. We have the concept of a core dispatcher, which was attached to your core window. Now that concept of core dispatcher still exists, but it's not going to dispatch you to the proper thread when you're running when you're on WinUI 3 on desktop. So you actually want to use the dispatcher queue, uh, which luckily there is a new dependency object dot dispatcher queue. And this uh, dependency, obter, dependency object is inherited by UI element geometry, framework template style, resource dictionary, and many other classes. So if you're just inside a page, you will be able to do this dot dispatcher queue and you just have an instance of it. So it's not going to be uh, complex to actually achieve that. You might have some issues if you use MVVM and you're inside the view auto trying to dispatch something to the dispatcher queue. Um, the thing is that there's a new static method called dispatcher queue that gets for current thread. So as long as you are in a thread that is the main UI thread, uh, then you can just call that method, store that somewhere, and then later from a different thread, you can dispatch that to a, uh, a new task and then uh, call that, that dispatcher queue instance that was returned from, from the get from current view in a previous state and just call the um, NQ, try and queue method, which is quite similar uh, to the one we had on core dispatcher. So it's, it's a very equivalent API. It's not going to be that hard for you to migrate from, all, uh, from uh, the core dispatcher to the dispatcher queue. Uh, another interesting difference is that WinUI 3 on util P still uses .NET Native. We do intend to support .NET 5, uh, but that's still being planned out. We might have some more information on that uh, soon. Um, and WinUI 3 desktop, when it's running on Win32, it actually today uses .NET 5. And as I mentioned, .NET 5 Preview 5. Um, an interesting concept that we had, you have to imagine that WinUI itself is written in C++, not in .NET. So how can the list view uh, class that you have on, that, that is built on WinUI 3 or, or even on UDLP, which was also built with C++, how can it know to listen to a system 
dot component model dot I notify property changed. How can the system know that? So um, it, it was actually a, a, a process that was done during the, uh, during the compilation of your UDLP application, it would map that those classes with the same ID. So they had like a mapping system from the windows.ui equivalents of all those system dot uh, component model dot I notify property change, I notify collection change, which you probably used before as an observable collection. So you had all those mapped to C++ equivalent types that were mapped um, by the compiler of UDLP applications. But now that we moved everything from the outside of the compiler and just being distributed as a library, we couldn't have that built in into the compiler. We needed something new that was also a dependency that would map that for you. And that is what CS Greener T provides. So it's a new tool create, to create the projections, the C sharp file projections from the WinMDs that are the output of the compilation of WinUI. So it, they're pretty much just metadata. So it's a Windows metadata um, description files that it, it's a completely out, a transparent process for you to have to know that. But it's important to understand why WinUI 3 on UULP still doesn't support .NET 5 is because CS Winner 2 requires .NET 5 uh, and it runs only on uh, Win32 applications. So in order to be able to support .NET 5, we need CS Winner 2 to support running on .NET Native, which is not something that simple. Of course, it is possible. Um, a community member already shipped that uh, version of a hack that he did um, that supported that. So if you want to try it out, just please be, your, be my guest. Um, and more of that will come officially from Microsoft um, soon. So another very important thing is your dependencies. Of course, you're never very unlikely that you just build your application out of nothing. You very likely use Newtonsoft, the JSON to deserialize or serialize JSON files. You're not gonna build your own library. So you do have dependencies. And we're, when you're talking about .NET, we're talking about NuGet. So the toolkit packages that we had as dependencies of the toolkit itself were the XAML behaviors SDK, which we literally had to migrate um, and ship a new version. So now we have equivalents of the XAML behaviors managed uh, library that are built on top of the WinUI uh, library. So it's already public on NuGet, so you can use it and leverage your applications. We also had to migrate the color code.udlp, which was a dependency that we had. It was built mostly for the toolkit, but it was built by a community member. Now we are bringing that inside the Windows Community Toolkit as well. Uh, but now we have a new version, which is the color code.winui. And we also uh, have a dependency on Win2D. Some of you uh, might have heard of Win2D. It's one library that implements uh, many composition APIs. I'm not going into many details, but uh, it does provide a bunch of functionalities uh, whenever you want to play with um, with visuals in the uh, Universal Windows Platform application. And if that library doesn't support WinUI 3, then we can't use it. Um, so that's the one thing that we just literally didn't have the time. So uh, if you want to follow up on the issue, there is an open issue. Uh, we are already working on um, enabling that for you. So there will be a Win2D version of um, that is based on WinUI 3. But uh, we couldn't use that on the toolkit because it just doesn't exist yet. So some functionality, so anything that uses the Microsoft the graphics, the canvas, uh, or actually anything under, under the Microsoft uh, graphics name space uh, is just not going to be there. So we actually had to comment that out of our code. So some of our controls, as one example, the eyedropper control just doesn't work. It's very likely that we either throw an exception or we just don't render anything. Uh, that was easier for us to know when to switch back instead of just removing the files completely and bringing them back. <clears throat> So for the sample app, we also had a couple more dependencies. So that's the Monaco editor, which by the way, Michael Hawker is the one that built the wrappers around it. Uh, so the Monaco editor is a library for you to have like live, live editing code 
inside the browser, but the Monaco editor that, that Michael built is a wrapper on top of the web view control to have that working on top of a ULP application. So it's a very cool um, NuGet patch that exists, but of course the web view is not supported inside WinUI 3. So we had to use WebView 2, which is the new WebView component, which is not based on, on the old edge, it's based on the new Chromium edge. So we had to migrate that one as well to actually make the toolkit, the sample app work. So we do have a Monaco version uh, based on WinUI 3. There's also the notification visualizers library, which is mostly for live tiles, which unfortunately is not open source, uh, but inside internally inside here microsoft we we did have access to that source code so we will in the future provide a version of that so that the one that you just saw on the sample app is this version that i migrated from the notification visualizer visualizer library that targeted the built-in controls to target when you write three so where is all this source well if everything was built out in the open so just go to github.com slash windows dash toolkit slash Windows Community Toolkit and go to the WinUI branch and you can see every single commit and every single thing that I did. Um, just the requirements for the demo are pretty much, or to run that is just the VF 2019 16.7 preview three. Don't try to use it with the stable version of yes, you need a preview version. So if you try to use 16.6, .6, it's not going to work. You need 16.7 latest stable version, I think it's now preview six, but anything after preview three should be fine. Uh, you do need the .NET workloads and the ULP workloads. You do need to install .NET 5 preview five. Uh, and in the future, we'll have support for the latest versions of .NET 5 preview uh, as well, very likely that preview three will fix that. Um, you also want to download the Visix that actually adds the, if you want to create a file new project, a file new WinUI 3 project, just download the Visix templates. And in order to use the toolkit, just add the MyGet uh, feed to your VS or just add a NuGet.config file to your project that works as well. Th those are all the requirements and you should be able to leverage all those controls um, from, from Win32 applications running on top of WinUI 3. So that is all I had to share today. Thank you very much. And I, now we are opening for Q&A. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah, we've got, I think there's some questions being flying through the chat, but um, some some guy called the Zamal Lab is on and he's answering all the questions. Oh. Don't know who he, don't know who he is. Well, I don't know, but I just, I just know that the Lama loves Zamal. <laughs> So uh, Zamalama is Michael. <laughs> He's the one yeah, presenting Michael's, to you next week. <laughs> yeah, Michael's been uh, Michael's been uh, valiantly answering lots of the questions that have come through. So I think he's uh, I think he's covered everything. Oh, that's perfect. No questions then. <laughs> he's the audience. 